I move to see us on the program today, we have Edwin Edabiri of the uh, I Am Happy Project. Also, uh, Tim Kusnudinov from, <laughs> I think I got that right, close. Uh, Kusnudinov, Kusnudinov, there we go, of Integrate Cal Community Partners uh, uh, corpora uh, Corporation. So, you know, welcome to the show. And uh, hey, so glad to have you both here. Thank you. Uh, we're on the air on uh, Access Sacramento, Channel 17 in, Cal in, uh, in Sacramento, as well as uh, YouTube. Uh, we've got a Facebook channel, Libertarian Counterpoint. And, uh, of course, uh, you can watch it uh, on the web at uh, www.accesssacramento.org, Channel 17, uh, at uh, 8 p.m. Thursday, noon, Friday, 4 a.m. Saturday. So th those are all Pacific time. Thank you for being part of, part of the show. And I'm particularly interested in, in the message that you have, uh, Edwin, how to be happy. I am happy project. Yes. You figured it all out, huh? Well, if I can say that, I would not be sitting here with you. I would probably be somewhere out of space or something like that. No, I did not figure it out yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think uh, what happened was back in 2009 at the recession. Yeah. And uh, I do a little bit of meditation. So uh, I'm meditating and I'm telling myself, I can't do anything about the global meltdown, but maybe I can do something about one person. And so that was kind of what spoiled us. So uh, I got out meditation one day and just w went to the street and I start asking people on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you today? And then they give me a number and we talk about happiness. In some cases it's a couple minutes, some other cases it's 10 minutes, some fixes, and I wish sometime, what am I doing here? It's like two hours, but I just made myself available. And I think during those era of 2009, 2010, to say things were tough would be an understatement. And so people just wanted to talk. And so I showed up, I was refreshing, and we had a dialogue. So I just continued doing that. Uh, Channel 10 heard about what we were doing. They did a small documentary on it. And then it just blew up from there. Okay, so your, your, your shtick, so to speak, was basically asking the question. Yes. How on are you happy? On a scale of one to ten, how happy are you? How today? happy are you? And then the conversation proceeded from it there. It proceeded from there. And what did you find out was the, uh, what, what correlated? What, what, what was the uh, uh, people who were happy, uh, what, what did they have in common? Very simple stuff. Number one, they were content with themselves. Content with what they have? What they have, yeah. Okay. And I think that ended up being the common denominator because the vast majority of the people that were not happy were so concerned about what they don't have. Aha. Uh -huh. So the root of unhappiness would be envy? Well, no. I wouldn't no? say that. Although that might be part of it, but I don't really think so because even if you don't envy somebody and you still want to have something, it's just a way of showing appreciation for what you have. And when you, are when you are okay with what you have, that doesn't mean you don't have goals and you don't want more. It's just you don't have that sense of stress that is tied to it, and you don't put your happiness on hold. You know? So there were a lot of contingency on happiness. There were a lot of, if I did this, I will be happy. If I can get that, I will be happy. If I get this significant person, I will be happy. So everything was put somewhere else forgetting that they already have all that is really necessary to be happy. Okay, so uh, were you able to take that information and become a happy person, a content person yourself? Yes, and, and actually I think in the process of interviewing that many people, I end up interviewing over 1,000 people. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so. Now, were, you doing this, were you doing this on tape or? Uh, well, I wish I did that, you know, okay. because, and also to maybe I'm happy I did not, because in the process I could have made some people more uncomfortable and then they would not be as open. So it was very spontaneous. It was like, okay, do we need to sit in the corner of this place? Then that's where we sit, you know? Do we need to go there? And, 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 and when ABC was following me, I was a little bit concerned how honest people would be with me when they see crew behind me. And fortunately, they didn't pay attention to them. <laughs> so it was really cool. So in, in the process- Now you say ABC, ABC- Yeah, uh, Channel 10, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, Sacramento, yeah, yeah. So in the process, I learned a lot about why I was happy, <laughs> you know? And, and so that kind of helped me to develop this whole concept that I call the happiness as a skill. You know, so, so, so we are told, and psychologists said, 
happiness is an emotion, which it is, you know, but it's not something that you don't have any control over. And then one of the things that I joke about is that a couple can be in a fight or some intense altercation, and the judge can sentence one of them to anger management. And anger is an emotion. So what makes you think they can learn to be less angry and they cannot learn to be more happy? <laughs> But if it works for one emotion, it, it should, work for it should work for the other. So, um, of course, you can ask whether it works for it, the former. I, yeah, e exactly. That's a whole different story. But uh, apparently, I think the consistency of sending people there shows that it does improve. But what we have found out is that if you learn some very basic skills, and these are skills that every human being have access to, and it doesn't cost any money, so you can't say, because I don't have money, that's an excuse, you can become better. You can increase your level of happiness. You can sustain your level of happiness. So you don't go into this wishy, you know, up and down kind of situation. I'll give you an, an example. And this example is actually backed by a study that was conducted by Harvard Medical School. That if you just write down one or two, maybe three things that you are thankful for every day, it takes about five minutes, you do it that consistently for six months, you would have raised your level of happiness by 10%. And in put it in proper perspective, that would be equivalent to someone getting double their annual salary. Except the difference is, if you get double your annual salary, that might get you happy for a short period of time until you get used to it. Whereas if you take this approach, you get consistently happy and it lasts for a longer period of time. So basically gratitude loop. Absolutely, yeah. And so those are the little things. So, and, and another thing that works very well is volunteer, is, is be of service to somebody else. And, and, and people will say, well, I don't have time to volunteer. And I say, yeah, you're telling me you don't have time to be happy. That's okay, we can agree on that. You know? And they say, no, I don't mean it like that. I say, you don't need to interpret it. <laughs> you know, if you don't have time to be of service to mankind, then that's part of being happy then you don't have time to be happy. Well, that's interesting. I, I've, uh, over my, you know, uh, many, many, many years of existence, come up with my own philosophy of happiness, which is that if you try to be happy, you won't. Okay. But if you try to achieve, try to be of service to your fellow, uh, to humanity, try to uh, do things that are worthwhile in the larger sense, uh, the striving, the attempt, the uh, you know, the, the working at, at, at doing something worthwhile will make you happy. Absolutely. Happiness is a byproduct. Yes, it is. Would you agree with that? Totally. Okay. Totally, yeah. And, and again, I think the only reason why the whole idea of even setting a goal to be happy come into it is if you are not practicing those underlying fundamental already. If you are, then it's mute. There will be no need. <laughs> If you're, yeah, if you're doing the gratitude, if, if, you're, doing, uh, if you're not envious. If, if you're, you're not envious of people, if you, if you, uh, uh, if, 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 you know, I talk about compassion. And right away, people are thinking compassion for other people. Mm -hmm. And I say, no, that's good. You need to be compassionate to others. That's good. But you need to be compassionate to yourself. And people forget that. And also, so for example, you made a mistake and you're cursing yourself out. You're beating yourself so hard. Someone want to call 911 for you, but they can't because you are the one. You, you have the right to beat yourself, you're right? If, if you did that same thing to somebody else, someone else will call 911. <laughs> so, so I said, what if your best friend made the same mistake? Would you treat them like that? And they said, oh, no. So then why are you treating yourself like that? So let me ask you. You, you're, you live in Davis. Yes. And what, uh, and you, uh, when you started this project, you did it in Davis, Sacramento area? No, I actually started it in Chico. In where? Oh, Chico. In Chico, yeah. I was living in Chico Coney at that time. Uh, Chico of all places, yeah. A and it was very interesting because... What were you doing in Chico? Just, I'm, I'm trying to get your life story here. Yeah, I know, well, and that's why we might get to that. Eh? Well, my children went to Chico State. The party and school, okay. Yeah, right. and the play school, yeah. And, <laughs> and they were happy, I guess. They were happy, yeah. you know, and until the city decides we don't want too many of you guys coming here uh -huh. to be happy, you know. But, yeah, so it, the whole experience started at the Benson Noble bookstore in Chico. And it was really, after I got out of meditation, and part of what I wanted to do was shift people's mind from all the negativity that was just going on at that time. Well, what made you decide to want to do that? 
I think he was partially just watching people. And I, you know, some of the friends that were really excited, enthusiastic, the energy started to be down. People were just scared. You know, some of them are asking, what's going on? They still have your job? They say, oh, yeah, but I don't know how long, you know? And, and some of them like, well, now I got to go figure out how to retire. I thought I was going to retire in five years. It might be 15 years. I may never retire anymore. I'm like, whoa, what is going on? You know, the focus was just too much on all the negativity that was going on. And, and, and yeah, it was so interesting, especially in retrospect. Some of the people I talked to then, I said, you know what, time has a way of passing, you know, if you just made it, you know. And guess what? All the homes that were underwater at that time have come back up. The stock market is all time high and a lot of those things. And yet, people were stressing themselves on so many fronts on things they have absolute no control over. Now, I'll share one quick story, and this was the catalyst for me. So, I'm in Jack London Square in Oakland, okay? Beautiful Sunday morning. And I've asked this question maybe over 500 times at that time. So a young man was coming towards me, and I said, hey, excuse me, and can I ask you a quick question? And he said, no. I said, okay, this is gonna be a little challenge, you know? So I said, come on, it's gonna be a really quick question. And he said, not really. I said, come on, this is a beautiful Sunday. What you, what's up? So he realized I wasn't gonna let him go that easy, so he said, okay, whatever it is, just ask it because I gotta go. So I said, on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you right now? And he gave me by far the worst score. And I'm thinking, wow, this is beautiful Sunday. And this is self-assessment. Why would anybody do this? So I said, can I share a quick story with you? And he said, no. I said, here we go again, you know? I said, come on, I'm gonna make it really quick. Then, it, so he said, okay, go ahead. Uh, it was getting annoyed, I said, okay. So the first thing that came up, man, I just started sharing. At the end of that first story, I said, can I share one more? And he didn't say yes or no, so which was untypical of him. So I assumed it for a yes, so I did, and then I just was on the roll. About nine stories later, I stopped, <laughs> and I reached to shake his hand, and he grabbed my hand really hard, and, and he goes, what's your name? I said, well, as a general rule, I don't share my name because I didn't want any string attached. I didn't want people thinking, oh, this guy is just nice. and might come back to try to sell us something or something. So I said, no. And the guy is still holding my hand. He said, well, you know what? This, you know, I'm not going to go for that. I didn't want to talk to you at first. You kept me here for almost 30 minutes. The least you can do is give me your name. I'm like, whoa, okay, okay. So I gave him my name. And he asked for the spelling, I spell it for him. Then he released my name and he thanked me and we left. I didn't think anything of it. Next day, I got a call from this young man. I'm like, okay, he goes, do you remember me? I say, yes, from Jack London Square. And I say, but what I don't remember is giving you my number. And he said, oh yeah, I Google you. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, that's easy. I've had the same number for about 20 years or something, so okay. And he said, I just called to say thank you. I said, what's going on? Yeah, I'm the one that had you hostage. If anything, I should be the one that's grateful. And that's when he broke the news that when I stopped him, he was on his way to commit suicide. So I asked him, why were you in so much hurry? He said he just wanted to get it over with. And I said, what happened? He said, well, all the things you were sharing, you know, a lot of them I didn't understand because of your accent. I said, no, you were rushing me, so I had to be fast to see how many stories I can get in. And he said, no, a lot of them make sense. It resonates. So I went back home. The suicide note, I flipped it, and I started writing all the things I was thankful for and happy about. And if you remember when you helped me, I gave you a zero. I said, yeah, that's why I, w I wasn't going to let you go. And he said, but I ended with 29 different things. Mm. And I was like, whoa. And I said, well, you know what, though? You need to go see a counselor. And he said, yeah, I've been seeing a counselor for like two years and nothing work. So I said, well, now you're in a different frame of mind. Can you go see a different counselor? And he goes, are you a counselor? I said, no. <laughs> so, and he goes, just thank you. And he hung up. And I was dumbfounded. You know, before now, it was like, okay, sure, I put a smile on somebody's face. It wasn't that dramatic. But all of a sudden, it changes. So that was what catapulted me to the next level of saying, wait a second, there gotta be other people like this young man out there that need someone to just listen and not judge 
and just share whatever they can share. So that's how I end up creating a platform that brings people together. And I think we have like 64 chapters now in 19 countries. 64 chapters, 19 countries? Yes. Wow. Yeah. And uh, you made a living out of it. Well, so initially, no. Oh. You know, so, so somebody brought to my attention and he said, wait a second, this you're doing for individual is great because I actually set it up as a nonprofit. He said, but what about businesses? There are a lot of employees that are not happy at work. So we end up creating a separate organization called the Happy Neighborhood Project that is targeting businesses. That I'm making a living out. All right. Well, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and you're based here in Sacramento, David? Yes, we are in downtown Sacramento. All right, all right. Now, some people try to get happy yes. by uh, putting together gratitude lists <laughs> and uh, not being envious of their fellow man. Some people try to get happy, uh, have, a, have, a, have a challenge in getting happy because they're, they're ill and they have, say, any, uh, you know, a very uh, debilitating long-term uh, disease, one which there is a, a medicine for, but that medicine doesn't happen to be legal. I'm talking, of course, about cannabis. You know something about that, Tim. Uh, and you're in the business of making that more uh, legally available in California, right? That would be one of the things that we're doing. Um, tell, tell us everything that you're doing with the, uh, the Integrate Cal Community Partners. I'd love to. Uh, so we've been around for a little over two years now, uh, and we're primarily a consulting and project and business management firm uh, based and headquartered uh, and founded in Davis, California, um, which is the reason I came back to Davis for the third time, uh, studied there at the, at the university. But it came from, a, from experience in the activism and advocacy space, a lot of which had to do with um, the Young Americans for Liberty group that I was uh, greatly involved with before. Some of it had to do with uh, um, more localized things and, and, and seeing how people were being treated by certain authority figures. Um, and some of it was also just a fascination of this brand new space that seemed to be coming into its own after a hundred years of prohibition and terrible policies. Um, so with, with a few other folks, we founded it and uh, basically started helping the city of Davis guide its cannabis policies, helping write some of the regulations. We had a 55-page uh, white paper that we submitted to them, that, uh, and, and that grew into wanting to know more and more, and we spread into the Yolo County space and then into the Capitol Corridor area, um, and now we have uh, a lot of different projects and a lot of different interests um, all throughout Northern California, and uh, our goal is to, as a benefit corporation, which is a new corporate model, yes. um, where our goal and our duty is to balance fiduciary and monetary interests with community development and benefit interests. So as long as one is balanced with the other, then both are justified. Um, and it's basically coming out of the new wave, uh, especially in the West Coast and places like California, um, of the, this uh, sustainability and uh, 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 social environmental stewardship sort of mantra, um, as in uh, the hybrid corporation model being a stopgap answer to a lot of the things that uh, people have found wrong with corporations. Now, uh, I'm generally not of the uh, group or understanding um, of wanting to bash on corporations or private enterprises, but uh, we found that this was a very interesting and new and novel vehicle that we could set a lot of standards for. At the time, I couldn't find any other consulting uh, entity based in California that was primarily directed towards cannabis interests. Um, you know, that's, that's been changing and people are seeing the value of the benefit model and they're trying to plug it in in different places. But uh, with the boom of the cannabis industry, from the black to the gray to now the, the, uh, uh, the light, um, so to speak, uh, there's tremendous opportunities. Uh, a lot of it doesn't uh, go through all the way like people want. You run into people who want to open dispensaries all the time, for example, and, and my answer or question to them is, why do you want to do that? Is there some kind of glory attached to that idea? Because it's, it's very, very difficult, yes. um, and, and the, the uh, profit margins are very low, um, and, and the folks who want to operate in this space, whether they've been doing it for decades or they're getting into it recently, um, there's a lot of opportunities outside of just dispensing and retail. Um, you know, manufacturing, uh, distributing, testing, all this sort of stuff. And it's, although it is heavily tempered by government agencies and a lot of regulations and a lot of the work that I personally do for our clients, 
um, and in different projects across the state is making sure that they're compliant, looking up all the different regulations and dozens of different agencies, local, regional, state. Um, the, the ones on the federal level are a little more tricky, uh, especially with the, uh, the changing of the guard in the election of Donald Trump to the, the White House um, and Jeff Sessions' appointment as the Attorney General. That has been causing some chaos in the industry, but where Integrate Cal is rooted right now is uh, in, in the core of a lot of different places. And we're within the ancillary market for this too. So uh, uh, although we wanna be directly involved in a lot of different operations, if say something was to happen from the feds, I don't lose any sleep at night uh, for my own co uh, company. And we do our best to ensure that all of our clients, all the people we work with are in tip top shape um, if the feds do come knocking. And mostly the fear with the feds coming in is pertaining to the non-medicinal side. Um, and, and some of the folks who absolutely refuse to follow the new regulations. Um, it is very, it's a high burden and a high uh, barrier to entry with all of these new regulations. I mean, I don't know if you guys remember the, all the changes that we had last year. Um, going from 2016 to, we had the MMRSA, a, uh, um, a combined bill from three different separate bills passed uh, in different points in time. Uh, that was primarily for the medicinal side and then there, it changed into the Medical uh, Cannabis uh, Regulation and Safety Act. And then we passed Prop 64, right, Adult Use of Marijuana Act. Mm -hmm. And then that was reconciled by the governor primarily um, and, and his legislative aides and, and the folks at the Capitol here um, to create the uh, Medicinal and Adult Use Regulation and Safety Act. So it went through all of these, these different steps that happened around June of last year. And in November, they released uh, the, the state agencies, the bureaucracies involved in administering all of this, released dozens and dozens of pages of emergency regulations that would be placed on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, and those are just the primary agencies. We're not talking even about the uh, uh, water board regulations or the different divisions in the uh, in the state government or how all of the different localities, uh, municipal governments, county governments, want to have a piece of the pie, uh, you know, putting lots of different permitting fees, license fees, uh, different levels of taxation, excise taxes, especially for the, um, the burgeoning adult use market. Uh, all of the costs for setting things up, sometimes it costs between 250000 and a million dollars to get one operation going. Yeah. Um, so it's not necessarily this Everyone is at the table, kumbaya dream that a lot of folks in the old guard of the uh, of the industry thought it would be. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely providing a lot of opportunities, and if you're strategic and smart about it, and you make the right kind of uh, uh, partnerships within the space, then you can definitely get a foothold in it. And that's what I've been working at very feverishly, night and day, and on weekends um, for the better part of two years now. Um, and it's it's we see the progress and, we, and it's very rewarding work, but it's very difficult work and it's sure. not for everybody. Um, and it certainly doesn't help that we get little surprises like um, the Cole memo being rescinded and uh, the Sessions memo being put in place of it. It's basically saying the federal uh, uh, protections or they're not even protections, but the the deferment of any kind of federal action for um, state based medicinal cannabis operations now recreational too, are completely gone. It's up to the discretion of the federal prosecutors of each state. To well, yeah, I mean, the, the Cole memo under the Obama administration, uh, it was nothing more than uh, the uh, Justice Department saying, we're going to ignore the law. Right. That's essentially all right. it did. It, uh, we're, it, we're going to ignore the law as far as uh, medical marijuana, uh, and I guess at that time, right. uh, uh, recreational marijuana in states where it's legal. And that's all, all fine as well, but as we saw with the election of Trump and the appointment of Sessions, it can be gone in a heartbeat, and, and it, uh, it did go away uh, in a heartbeat. Uh, it all comes down to the uh, fact that marijuana is the Schedule I drug, right up there with heroin and fentanyl and uh, opium sense, and, right? and uh, I think uh, a few other you know, more deadly, to say the least, drugs. Congress is the... Uh, entity that has failed to act. Big time, yeah, uh, that's what I'm saying. Why is they not changing federal law? It's changing the identification of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we're yeah. looking yeah. at a country, yeah. we're looking at a country where something like 64% or more of the population thinks marijuana should be legalized and Just all like that a stuff. cigarette. And, but and we're looking at a country where, we're, use mm -hmm. we're looking at a country where a majority of Republicans <laughs> right. 
a majority of res uh, conservatives think that marijuana should be uh, legally available to yeah. adults. What is Congress waiting for? Well, that's you, you have an answer, I can tell. <laughs> There's a lot of potential answers to this. Uh, a lot of special interests that are currently in still involved in this. What's interesting is uh, some of the uh, uh, fingers are pointed to pharmaceutical industries um, and companies and people within that um, sector and We're other- Looking to about competition? Right, right. But what's interesting is wh one of the first sectors in, in uh, the industrialized developed world, especially here in the United States, going back 100 years that utilized uh, uh, different extracts and parts of the cannabis plant was pharmaceutical companies. Right. And you can find well-documented well records on this sort of thing. Absolutely. And it was only until that they agreed with the feds to stop using uh, all of those different components that they could really put the brakes on uh, having freedom of access to uh, cannabis of any kind. So it's- Well, it's not just cannabis. I mean, you, no, can, even take the, you can even, even take the opiates. Patent right. medicine back uh, you know, uh, you know, around the turn of the 19th century, 1900 and earlier, was opium for the most part, uh, with a bunch of other mystery ingredients. Right. And uh, you know, two or 3% of the population was addicted, to use the word broadly, or uh, problem uses of, of patent medicines, and about the same percentage of the population is now uh, having a problem with, with, uh, with uh, opiums, uh, opiate uh, addiction today. Yeah. You know, it doesn't make any difference what the law is. The, if, if there's a, an addictive behavior, it's gonna exist regardless of what the law is. People just trying to be happy. Well, I, and talking <laughs> about that though, I just came about just like two days ago, and I'll share with you because I think it might help your cause. There is a gene that's already identified that the group that have that high level of gene represented in their body are happier than other people. And so scientists started to try to identify what's in that part of the gene that causes that. It said it naturally, in, you know, or maybe create. Can we're, 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 you know, we're going to leave that as a cliffhanger here. Oh, like here. the endocannabinoids, uh, yeah, those yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. We're out of time, but that's, <laughs> that's a great cliffhanger for, for a future show, sometime, okay, someplace okay. in the ether. Thank you very much for being part of the show on the Libertarian Counterpoint. We'll see you again next week. Thank you for having me. Thank you.